So Equal Pay Day is an international conference, and thanks to online, we are able to reach a lot of lot of hosts from all over the world. Uh, so we will come back to English, and I would like to warmly welcome our first guest, Jackie Brown Doyle. Jackie has worked in the media, communication, and marketing field for 30 years, and it seems as one of the world's leading communication strategists. She is currently leading communication for World Athletics, the number one Olympic sport. Jackie, uh, do you hear? Do you hear us? Are you with us? I am, and I can hear you. Hello. Good Perfect. morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Let me pass you the floor. Thank you. And clearly, I wrote the intro um, so, and my CV. So always important to take control of your own story. Um, so I'm here because of a uh, friend and somebody I met at Harvard. Hello, Andrea Martinova, um, who is a passionate um, advocate for equal pay and for women's rights. So I'm delighted to be here. And also thank you to Lenka for uh, taking the time to take me through everything. So it's important get all your thank yous out beforehand because you'll never know how quickly you're going to have to finish. So you've had five days of what looks like exceptional speakers, mentoring coaches. So it was actually a little hard to work out what I can share with you that may be different to what you've heard, but I'm going to try. And at the core, I'm a storyteller. So I'm going to share with you three stories. But before I do, I'd like to start with a quote. And it's a quote from the VP of Analytic and Advice at uh, Syndio Solutions. And her name is Katie Bardaro. She used to work for Payscale. Uh, the real issue here is not the gender wage gap, but the jobs gap. People are filling positions according to gender with higher paid positions being filled by men and lower paid positions being filled by women. That's the issue we really have to address. So I'd like to tell you three stories in the next 15 minutes and give you time to ask questions and hopefully someone can translate them. Um, so hold on to your hats. I talk fast. I've got a lot of things to say. Um, and I'm hope, hoping some of it at least will be interesting. The first story I want to talk to you about is my time working in communications agencies around the world and watching exceptionally talented women leave the workforce to have families and rarely return. The second story is my time at World Athletics, where I work now, and how we tackle the gender gap in our sport. And the third and last is best termed as advice based on 30 years of being a working woman. And I should note here, I have not had children, so I have not left the workforce ever. Um, but let's start with the first story. For half my career, I've worked in communications, PR agencies uh, in a number of different countries, in the UK, in Singapore, in Australia. Uh, I've worked in the USA and also many countries across Europe. I currently am based in Monaco. I know you're weeping now, uh, but that's where <laughs> the HQ is for World Athletics. It's not because I've become a millionaire. Um, there are two fundamental truths in the agency world. One is revenue and the other is relationships. There are actually many other, but good agencies rely on these two above all others. Relationships help you win and retain clients and revenue keeps you on a sound financial footing so you can run a business and grow. It's a people business and the best agencies invest in the best people. There is a fundamental flaw in many agencies and in many businesses. It's called in English, the three R's of human capital. Now, I know with translation, they may not all be R, but I'll tell you what they are. They state that an organization should invest in the three R's, recruit, reward, and retain to ensure its greatest assets and workforce grows stronger. A huge amount of revenue goes into recruiting. It takes time um, and money to recruit, a lot of both, and you lose money on new recruits for up to six months. Um, as they learn the job and they learn their clients. So you spend money on their office space, you spend money on their benefits, on their training, and lots of agencies also spend money on incentives. For example, like gifting the first year's bonus to a new recruit before they've even earned you a penny. So recruiting is a huge chunk of valuable revenue for a return somewhere down the track. It's a big bet. You're betting that the return over the long term, and note the long term will pay off, and you'll recoup your recruitment investment at least threefold. 
when it comes to reward and recognition, then it comes to reward and recognition, most valuable revenue spent nurturing your recruitment investment in the form of additional benefits. So how do you reward them? Bonuses, incentives, um, and other um, uh, incentives that help them to stay with you and not go to their competitor. And the third is retain. Again, more valuable revenue is spent on promotions, pay rises, corner offices, car parking spaces to stop your recruitment investment leaving to join a competitor. Remember the relationship truth. Even with today's no compete clauses, which stop employees leaving with clients or joining another agency to work on one of your clients' competitive businesses, relations have a very far reaching and invisible bond that is sometimes very, very hard to break. So whatever it takes to retain employees. Now I should point out that most of my agency career has been in integrated agencies with a mix of brand, consumer, tech, financial and sports PR. So a fairly good mix of um, clients. At least 50% of the workforce everywhere I have worked have been, uh, have been women. And more often, they've been more than 50%. Been more than 50 it's a young people's game, uh, communications and PR agencies. So at least 70% of the workforce have been under the age of 40, and it's highly competitive. It's a take no prisoner environment where you charge by the hour and each individual has a hefty financial target to meet. You know what's coming next, right? All is going well. Your recruitment investment is paying off. Excellent relationships with clients have been formed and the revenue is flying in. When all of a sudden, out of the blue, your prized recruitment asset gets pregnant and nine months later leaves to start a family. Why we can't work this out when you have a young workforce under the age of 40 absolutely never ceases to amaze me. It is going to happen and people should plan for it. But as an employer, certainly in countries I've worked in, you're obliged to keep that job or a similar job open for when that employee returns to work after her maternity leave and also pay a certain amount of employee maternity benefits. I know the Czech Republic paid maternity leave is far longer um, than many other countries, certainly like the UK and certainly Australia, which is very, very short. And you have to replace, employers have to replace the employee with some form of short-term maternity cover uh, contract. You're seeing the dollar, euro, pound signs really adding up as an employer. Then you wait for the maternity leave to end and the return of your highly talented, highly trained by you employee. However, what tends to happen more often than not, in my experience, is that you receive the call a month before the return to hear the words, I'm not going to come back. There are tons of reasons given. And if the truth be told, you knew that, and you expected this to be the case in almost every conversation, certainly every conversation I've been part of. We all danced around the inevitable for a year or less, or sometimes more, depending on the country. So in my last role as CEO and chairman of the Good Relations Group, I decided to find out why women were not returning to the workplace, our workplace and other agencies. I did a bunch of research and recruited friends and people in other agencies to research on my behalf. The four most common reasons given off the top of their head were these. It's a fast paced and competitive environment. And I don't think I can devote the time or energy required to do the job properly. Number two, I would prefer to get a part-time job so I can continue to look after my child, children, and PR agencies don't really cater for that. Three, childcare is too expensive and I worry about leaving my child or children in the care of someone else. And four, I'm just not ready to go back to work full-time yet. There were other reasons too, but these were the most common four that were raised. There is little most employees can do about number three, as much as I would have liked to. And don't get me wrong, there are PR agencies and other employers who provide childcare in the workplace, which is amazing, but they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. When my team of researchers, as I said, made up of friends and colleagues, delved a little deeper, there was a worrying underlying trend to all the other reasons given, the other three reasons, and that was fear and lack of confidence. They felt that they'd been out of the workplace too long, would not be able to master new technology or systems that had been put in place while they were gone. 
uh, would not, they would let their colleagues down, would feel guilty about leaving dot on time every day when colleagues were still working and having to work late to finish a task for a client or a new business pitch, uh, or would not be able to give their job 100%. Well, quite frankly, who actually does do that? Anyway, the lists go on as to why, but it comes down to this very simple fact, fear and lack of confidence. And this got me thinking about the fourth R, and the fourth R is return. What if employers focus the same amount of energy and effort, and certainly less money, on working out how to deal with this fear and lack of confidence? Now, it wasn't all plain sailing when I asked the managing director of one of the companies within the Good Relations Group to consider creating a part-time role for a senior member of his team, and I'm gonna re-emphasize that, uh, on their return from maternity leave, or consider a job share with another person. He went off with a frown to think about it for a week. When he came back, he said, blurted out, it won't work. Clients want agencies on call 24 seven. It's too risky to job share, as inevitably things would slip through the cracks. And this was probably the worst reason. The rest of the team would resent them and it wouldn't be fair on them. I was truly astonished. This said way more about the culture of the company he was running rather than any individuals within it. And as MD, he could change the culture, but he was just not willing to do so. I would like to end this story with a happy ending, but sadly I can't. I moved into another area of the business probably much to the relief of that particular managing director of mine. But I did, however, write up what a return policy would look like, which I'd like to share with you today. So first, fundamentally, a business needs to make money, right? You've got to start with that. So returning to work after maternity leave makes financial sense. Always have to start with revenue and costs. You've invested in this person, you've trained them. So returning them to your workplace so you can continue to earn through them makes complete business sense. And it's really important to start with that. Number two, training. Um, set up e-learning modules for new technology and processes. You have had to take all your employees through the same element or some element of training at least. Uh, so make it available to returning mothers on a platform that suits their hours of learning often in the middle of the night, as I found out. Share, share pitches, share insights, share the work that you and your agency and your company have been doing uh, while they've been away. So much investment goes into pitches, insights nowadays, you wanna share them. Pitches can be filmed, Q and A sessions organized, info sessions planned. And if the last year has taught us anything, everybody knows how to work on Zoom everybody knows how to access information in a completely different way. Number four, flexibility. You have to make returning to work easy. I have never, and I really mean this, never had a team member of mine return to work after having a children, sometimes more than one in a period of two and a half years, not work incredibly hard. It may not be from nine to five every day, but if you're willing to listen to how they're able to work, then you can find a way to create a work environment that works for everybody. Number five, time. Take your time. Allow returning employees time to reconnect. Remember, when you recruited that person, they may have been on a three month notice period. You probably brought them into the office to meet the team. You probably took them out for a drink. You probably, they probably joined some internal meetings. They probably contributed to a brainstorming session or pitch ideas for something that they were uh, working on at the time. Do the same for those returning. Don't expect people to walk in on day one of returning from maternity leave and just assume things are you know, it's business as, as usual. Number six, and this works for both employer and employee is honesty. And it's hard, it's really, really hard. We all wanna be the dream that we have of ourselves in our minds. We don't wanna have confrontational conversations, but both parties have to talk honestly about how things are working. What is difficult for both parties, work through how to change it. Open dialogue with the team to ensure that there are no hard feelings that get built up with other team members. And returning employees need support. These are hard conversations to have with their colleagues, uh, vulnerable conversations, and they need to feel that they can have the conversation with their employer, with their team members, without fear of retribution. 
Number seven, culture. And for me, this is by far the most important part. Um, as a leader, we have a responsibility, or as leaders of our teams, of our businesses, um, of anything that we are in charge of in the workplace, we have a responsibility to create a culture at work that enables people, not disables them. An inclusive employer sets their company apart from others. They attract the best people and they retain them for far longer. And again, it makes complete financial sense. This is not a CSR project. This isn't something that is a nice to have. There is a financial element here that makes it far, far better to keep employees when they would, if they would come back. So if the culture is right, no one loses, everybody wins. Now, many of you are probably mothers and many of you would never have known quite how you feel about returning to, lead, to work after you leave for maternity, no matter how long you take off. But many more will return if they know there is support and that the culture of the organization is one that embraces flexibility and doesn't stifle it. And after the crazy year we have all been through and still going through, um, it is not without belief that we cannot use the pandemic to look at things that are that have changed in our lives, right? We know we can do better flexible working methods. We know that processes are easier to access. We know that people can access information far more readily on a platform and in a time that suits themselves. If anything good has come out of this pandemic, it will be our ability to be flexible and get the work we need to do completed in a variety of new and exciting and accessible ways. The last thing I wrote when I wrote this um, return strategy was pay. And the last, even when brimming with confidence, women tend to avoid what they believe will be confrontational conversations. And most think that pay discussions are confrontational, but they shouldn't be. You need, but you need to lead the conversation and not respond to it. I hear so many women ask me, well, what do you think? Think, or what will you pay me? I hear so many men say to me, this is what I would like to be paid. And this is in a really important difference between the way men and women treat pay discussions. You need to control the conversation. You need to request your salary. You need to base it on the last salary you earned when you last worked, allow for inflation. It's really easy to find. And lastly, you need to work out what kind of percentage is um, important, you know, what kind of percentage that works out for the days or the time that you've decided to work. It really is that simple. But the most important thing is ask for what you want. Don't wait and then negotiate something from a sort of dead stop. So this is what I believe the R's of human capital should be. Four R's, not three. Return, reward, retain. So recruit, reward, retain, and return. This won't happen by chance. We need all leaders, men and women, to make this happen. And we all need returning mothers and others returning to the workplace after an absence, caring for a family member, or any other reason, to ask for this to make it work. I'm not suggesting that we take banners and we march down a high street, but every single person can actually start to ask for what they want uh, to do. My World Athletics story, you'll be pleased to hear, is much, much shorter. Um, when I joined World Athletics, it was going through a real crisis um, with um, the previous leadership uh, being found for all sorts of uh, 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 illegal criminal acts, and currently they are waiting for jail sentences. Um, but we wanted everybody in our sport, no matter where they sat in, the organization to believe they have the ability to contribute at all levels of the sport and this was really important including the very top job um, so world athletics is rightly proud of the gender equality it has on the field of play um, and an elite level competition so we have the same amount of events the women and the men get paid the same amount of money prize money is equal and but this took a generation to achieve right this didn't happen overnight it took a generation to achieve um, but we didn't see this across our organization and across our 214 member federations and even at headquarters and at our council level. So we needed to drive gender equality through the organization of the sport at every level. And this ended up being a far thornier issue than we anticipated, but for reasons that were really not that clear at the time. So in 2016, we set out a vast ranging reform agenda for the sport of athletics. 
and equality was one of them. We built our reforms around three questions. How does sport, our sport want to make decisions? Who do we want in our sport? And how do we evolve the sport to remain relevant? Uh, the result was over 200 changes to our constitution um, based on four pillars, evolution, ethics, equality and empowerment. And it's equality that I want to talk to you about today because we took a fairly bold stance on this. First, we set targets. Now, I know not everyone in this room will agree with this approach, but we chose this route. This intentional strategy to be actionable rather than to be aspirational, as we didn't want to leave anything to chance. Also, we're a sport who elects members of their to its federation boards, its areas, its council, which means it would be far too easy to fall into a boys network where women would be excluded. So our elections are every four years, and this became an eight year and then a 10 year plan. So essentially in 2017, we set a target and a stepped range of targets to make sure that by 2027, we had 50% gender balance on the sport of athletics, single biggest and most influential decision-making um, body, which was the council. Now, there were some issues I mentioned and in areas you wouldn't have immediately thought about. Actually, one of them was Europe, um, who at the time, this was back in 2016, had only one female president, that was in Ireland, and she had only just been voted in. So 2016 was the first time any of our 214, sorry, our 52 member federations in Europe had had a female president. Um, and they had really important comments to make about the timelines and about the pipeline. And this is what really led us to the changes we made. The reason that we extended to 2027 instead of 2025 for the 50% was that Europe and many of our other um, areas, Asia and Africa, said they needed to build the pipeline or we would fail. If we didn't build, this from ground up, we would end up not being able to meet. Oceania, South America, North America actually had a pretty good balance of female, um, uh, female talent. So this is what we did. We actually set up a gender leadership task force. We came up with a framework. We built it around four key pillars. And I'm not going to go through them, but I'm really happy to share all of this in, uh, you know, in, in a, a follow up with you. And the most important part of it was advocacy. And it wasn't, and this was about getting the men within our sport to understand that it was their responsibility to help to promote, to help to identify women that should be and uh, could be moving up through their organizations. Um, so we did that, we set clear objectives, we communicated, we got male advocacy, and we were lucky. Our president of World Athletics, Sebastian Coe, has been a huge advocate for. Um, having a balanced uh, workforce. When I ran communications for the London 2012 Olympic Games, uh, we had a leadership board of 50% women, and he insisted on that being the case. Um, and the results so far have been good. So, you know, we've had gender seminars taking place in every area. The first test of whether this um, work that we had been doing work was, was working was at our 2019 Congress, where we have elections. And uh, in those Congresses, four of our six areas chose a female vice president, first time ever. And 40% of all the candidates for our World Athletics Council elections at the end of 2019 were female. That was a 10% increase in female candidates on the previous election. And we also exceeded the target uh, of eight women elected for council. And one of those was the vice president, senior vice president of the sport. First time in the history of athletics that our council had a female vice president. And we also elected a male and female athlete to sit on council. Look, there's a lot more to do. This is a plan that goes through to 2027. But the point I really wanted to make here was that we chose a route, lots of companies don't do this. We chose a route, which was to set targets. And we felt that by doing that, we could address the barriers and we could address the, these solutions much, much better. <laughs> so the final piece of my storytelling, Link is looking probably at her watch, sorry, um, is um, to advice. Um, and again, I want to start with a quote. I'm a huge believer of quotes. And when I get to the end, Andrea will recognize the quote I give at the end from our Harvard days. Um, but the quote I want to... Um, leave with you today here is it's never overreacting to ask 
for what you want and what you need. And I think this is really important. It comes down to self-confidence and self-worth. And this is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's good to lack confidence. It's never good to lack self-worth, but it is good to reflect. So I've got 10 key points here um, about pay and about um, making sure you get what you want and what you need. You need to ask within your organization if there are any structured salary bans. You need to ask them to explain what they are. Um, and how it all works. Lots of organizations do it. Those that don't should be, and you should help drive that. Ask where the company currently places you in which of those bands and why. Yeah, it's a, this is a fact-finding exercise. It's not a pay negotiation. Don't get drawn into talking about your pay. Find out facts. Second, research the market, not your colleagues. Okay, once you start comparing your salary with people within your organization, actually, it just leads to really, really bad, pent up anxiety and hate, right? Don't do it. Face yourself and research the market. Find out what your role and really importantly, the experience you have is worth in the, on the open market. Third, prepare your pitch for the money to match your worth. And you need to think through the responses you're likely to get and work out your arguments. These take time, do it properly. Practice it on your friends, practice it on your family, see what questions they will ask, see if they believe you. Um, and if they are, you know, particularly family, they'll tell you whether they think that you are what we say in England, gilding the lily or whether you're being fair. Be honest about your work and base it on your experience and your skills, not your job title. It is, I see so many people sitting there saying, yes, but you know, this is my job title and I should be earning this amount of money. You know what? job titles are negotiable. This is about your experience and your skills. So sit there, list them out, work out what you do well, work out what you deliver to your organization and base your pay negotiations on that, not your title. When you come to go into the negotiation, be clear in your own mind, what is the least you're willing to accept? In negotiation business language, this is your BATHO, best and final offer. I'm hoping that Andrew is smiling at this stage. You do not need to share this with anybody, but you do need to be clear about what it is in your own mind. You really do need to be clear about it. And you should have a plan B. I'm infamous in my world of saying no plan B, but in this case, you have to have a plan B, but you have to plan not to use it. And plan B could be a percentage of the money now, the remainder in the following year, Something that will help an organization deliver what you want them to deliver. Number seven, be reasonable and honest about the amount you're seeking. Don't boost the amount in the hope of getting more or expecting the employee to negotiate down. Be honest. And then I think you should, not always, get an honest uh, response back. Eight, a no is not a rejection. Okay, I say this not to be patronizing, but to be helpful. Um, a conversation on pay can take many, many turns and it's easy to walk away with less than you want or nothing at all and think that this is a reflection on your worth. It really is not. And it's important to remember that. And my next point will help you make this case to yourself and to your organization. So the ninth point is annual reviews. I can't believe how many companies don't have them. I can't believe how many employees don't have goals and things that they want to um, achieve in a year and that their employers don't sit down and go through this with them. But this is true, so few people do, but insist on it. Insist on having clear goals set for you and insist on them being measured. Structured reviews help you have difficult conversations um, like um, pay in, a controlled, in a, a controlled way. But they also allow you to demonstrate your worth to an organization. If they're setting goals, you're meeting them, you're doing really well, there really is no reason that they should be turning around and saying no to fair pay. And then my last piece of advice is don't be afraid. Women are the best negotiators, right? Our inherent values of fairness and compromise make us the best negotiators. But we also don't love confrontation. Um, but we also, but we need to think of pay as a discussion, not a battle, right? Um, equal pay is a right. It's not a luxury. It's not something that we should feel lucky to have. It's a right for us to have equal pay. So go into any pay negotiation with this mentality and be prepared. Don't do this on the fly. 
don't do it by what you've seen on Twitter or anything that people have shared. Actually research this and base it on your skills and not your job title. Um, negotiate like a woman. Don't look to male role models. Remember, women are the best negotiators. So find female role models and act like a woman when you negotiate your pay. But remember, and I've said this, I know a number of times, equal pay is a right, not a luxury. So I want to end with a quote, um, which is from our poet, Mary um, Olivier, from a great poem, Summer Day. Andrea and I had this sort of instilled in our brains when we were at Harvard. And it's one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And that's an important one to remember. And if you ever need motivation, ever need motivation, and I will share this with you, and I think I put it in my notes at the beginning, Still I Rise by Maya Angelou is one of the best poems. Read it before you go into a pay negotiation. It will give you a whole bunch more confidence to face what you need to face. Thank you for a summary. Thank you for an inspirational speech. Uh, thank you very much.